thanks um, everybody so much for being here and thanks Brian for having me. Um, yeah, I think Battle Mesh will be actually probably only about 20 to 30% of what I actually talk about. Um, as Brian mentioned, I visited, a, uh, I spent the summer visiting a few um, of the other more well-known uh, community wireless slash mesh network projects um, that I was aware of, in, mostly in Europe. Um, and so I wanted to talk about um, some, st share some stories from those and some photos. Um, so yeah, I guess I'll start. This is, um, so this is Battle Mesh. It was held uh, this year in Vienna. It's the 10th annual Battle Mesh. Has anybody ever gone before or heard of this before? Okay. Um, so it was, I, I mean, I'm like a sort of borderline technical person. So I was kind of there as an anthropologist and I participated somewhat in the technical discussions. Um, I think the main thing happening right now with Battle Mesh is that as the name implies, it's this, um, it's, it's meant to be a kind of battle of the mesh protocols. And that was definitely like the main event of the conference, but it was, or I don't know if you could even, I guess calling it a conference is part of what's up for debate because the other part of the activities are like sh um, talks and presentations about um, people that develop firmware, people that develop protocols, people that um, do computer science graduate research about um, deploying mesh networks in different um, contexts. And so I tended to be kind of more focused on that, just given my background. Um, but there was some debate at the end about, um, about what the future of battle mesh should be. Some people actually said, maybe we should call it love mesh because they don't want to, you know, like this whole the war, th the war fighting aspect was maybe not the most important part of it. Um, this was the first day. It was hosted in Vienna at a place called MetaLab. It's kind of a hacker space in Vienna. They have their own... Um, community networking project called Funk Foyer, which means um, radio network tower. It borrows its name from like um, radio warning, I mean fire warning, system, Funk Foyer, yeah. Network, radio network fire. Um, that's, their, that's their kind of NYC mesh project in Vienna. Um, this is the whole group, this is pretty much everybody who was there. Um, this was the main space. Um, where all the talks were given, and then what most of the people here are working on is um, the the, te the test bed. So like there was a lot of uh, much ado about the test bed. So it was setting up all um, something like 15 um, Wi-Fi nodes throughout this space that was um, donated by the um, Vienna Folk Art Museum or something. Um, so at one point I decided to just go around and take pictures of a bunch of the, of the nodes just kind of for fun. Um, so they were spread out over um, four rooms in this space um, just to create a kind of artificial um, mesh. And then there were several tests that were run on this um, test bed of nodes, mostly um, ping tests, which were just flooding the network with pings and then testing how, ma you know, how many pings um, reach the destination for each protocol. Um, and then there was also iPerf tests that added a bunch of um, um, sort of background noise traffic and then tested the performance of the various protocols through, through that. Um, so while everybody was kind of like hacking and like running all these tests, I was kind of just like dilettante walking around taking photos of the, the nodes. But um, the, results of the, the results of the tests were posted online um, on their GitHub. So I suggest you take a look at that. It's too much for me to, there's not like a zinger punchline, the result of the test bed battle mesh was, but um, just to sort of briefly summarize, um, BMX and OLSR version one did the best for the ping tests because they took more conservative um, routing um, paths, so they delivered a greater percentage of their packets. But in the traffic, the the, the heavy traffic situations, um, BMX seven performed ha had a higher performance in terms of the um, the the actual ping times. Um, but there's a much more elaborated um, presentation of statistics if you go to their GitHub page. Um, I can send you the link after. I didn't put it in here. Um, yeah, and at one point I just started taking pictures of people's t-shirts because as this kind of, this kind of an anthropologist, it's hard to get nerds to talk about why they're there and what it means to them. And I realized like the messages are all just on people's t-shirts. So the general interest I think of people in, in Battle Mesh was, was this. Uh, there's no cloud, it's just other people's computers, which I'm sure everybody here is familiar with that kind of ethos and that's why you're interested. And then um, this is German, wir sind das Netz. It just means uh, we are the network. So the response to this kind of, the first one is kind of this idea that, you know, we can build our own um, 
we, you know, that's why we're all here. We can build our own mesh network. Um, this was a really nice moment. There was a lot of different, um, I guess, I don't want to say conflicting because everybody was like very much complimentary in their efforts, but there were um, several different firmware developers and protocol developers here. Um, at, at this particular moment, um, the guy in red uh, in the back top, um, his name's Nicholas um, Passe. He works with an organization called um, Alter Mundi, like alternate world. They develop a product called Libra Mesh, which is very similar uh, in a way to um, Gotenna, to the, to the presentation that we saw earlier. They're developing um, a low cost um, mesh enabled router that can be um, um, added to an existing mesh network just by turning it on and clicking through some uh, graphical inter like a um, web page config screen. And it kind of auto configures itself by pulling in config information from neighboring mesh nodes. And they've been rolling that out in the developing world in several different sites. And they're actively developing that. So they have their own GitHub. I would suggest you check that out. But this was such an interesting moment to me because Nick Nico was working with some other people um, mainly this guy and these other guys here who have developed other firmwares based off of OpenWRT. Um, and I don't know if you guys know of Lead um, and one called um, Gluon, which is being used in um, Germany in a lot of the mesh network projects there. And so they sat down together and they were like working out the differences on these different forks that they had each done from OpenWRT in an effort to kind of like hopefully merge back together these different um, these projects. And so they were like actually working through some of the different features and actually getting into some of the code and stuff. So I thought that was like a really nice moment of how the battle mesh is maybe, the future of the battle mesh is maybe not so much about battles and more about um, joining up some of these different projects. Um, so after that, I, I visited um, Giphy. Has anybody ever heard of, have you guys all heard of Giphy? Okay, so um, Giphy he, is here in Catalonia. Um, I just included this picture for context. Um, Barcelona, and then these two um, points here are um, a small town called Gurb and um, a slightly bigger town called Vic, V-I-C. Um, and this is where um, Gifi kind of originated. So I wanted to take some time on my visit to kind of like go back to the you know the original site. Um, so I, I got in touch with Ramon Roca, who was I guess kind of the founder of Gifi. Um, this is, he, this is, he picked me up in Vic and then drove me out to this um, small town Gurb. So this was us driving and here he pointed out that, that this red building, which I'll show more in a second, was um, the municipality building in Vic. This was the first place where Gifi sort of started. They, they had a, a DSL connection here and they set up a wireless link from here to the, to, to the top of this building and then from there they had one antenna pointing this way and another antenna pointing out towards the, this rural town. And that was the first, um, so this is a municipal building where they had DSL and an antenna on the roof. This is uh, Ramon pointing me towards the antennas that they have up here. Um, and you can kind of see they have, so they have an access point here that provides internet for this area. They have an antenna uh, point to point antenna pointing down to the municipal building, and then I have another antenna that you can't see here that's pointing off into the rural village. And from there, they set up a mesh of wireless nodes that connected quite a large um, bit of farm area within rural Spain. Um, so, t talking to Ramon was just like so fascinating. He gave me so many stories about the development of this project. This, I took a picture of this. This is the highway that goes from Barcelona to Vic. Um, and this was important because the performance of their network was, was, was originally um, quite slow. And so they were trying to figure out how they could, they could um, get a, um, a connection to the internet exchange in, in Barcelona. Um, should I do that? Okay. They were trying to figure out how they could get, have a point of presence at the internet exchange in, in Barcelona. Um, and they wanted fiber to... Um, they, they were trying to find out if they could get fiber to connect their Wi-Fi mesh in this small town to the internet exchange in Barcelona. This was a pretty new highway. They, they knew that there was fiber under this road, but everywhere, everybody they asked said no. They're, it's not there or you can't access it. Um, it's, it's private, whatever. It's, it's, a lot of it is owned by Telefonica, 
and Telefonica has taken over a lot of the previously public infrastructure, but with the stipulation that they have to be able to lease it back to other public organizations. But Telefonica was like, no, there's no fiber there. So um, what, what, what they did was he got a bunch of farmers with their tractors and said, all right, we're going to then have to run our own fiber along this highway to, from Barcelona to our small town. And we'll do it on you know, Saturdays and Sundays from like November to January. Basically, like everybody who's going to um, Andorra to go skiing for the weekend for an entire season will have to take the frontage road, which will take like five times as long. And they're like, oh, actually, I think maybe there is some fiber under that road, but you can't use it. So they went looking for it. This was the first place where they found um, a, a, an entry point to the fiber that was under this highway. Um, and they pried open this manhole um, and, um, and actually just connected it to um, a post here. And this, you can see this, this, this is the first bit of fiber that then runs out to this rural village. And then they initially shared the fiber through the existing wi wireless mesh that they had, but then realized that, that fiber was so cheap, they just bought a, a spool. Of, this is the spool of fiber <laughs> that they're now using as a picnic table. They made me the most delicious paella, and we sat around and ate this paella on their spool where they had bought fiber, and then now, so it still, I would say, is a mesh network, but it's actually not a wireless mesh. They've just connected this entire farming area with fiber. And, and he's like really excited about fiber. His, his, his um, idea was that fiber is so cheap that a lot of people, that like one of the things that they were doing was trying to pay for it by selling, by pulling up the copper and selling it. And the resale price of the copper was actually enough to pay for the fiber because it's so much cheaper. Mm -hmm. But still the logistics of it are, are still quite complicated. Um, and so, how much time do I have? It's been, okay, I'll try to go. So the most exciting part about Geeky to me was that um, th there had been a lot of other independent um, wireless mesh projects throughout Catalonia, mainly in Barcelona. There were several in Barcelona. And, and now Gifi, which started in this small rural um, village, basically, has kind of like subsumed all of them, not necessarily like replacing their infrastructure or their protocols or anything like that, but it's kind of like taken over as like the governing body of all these other previously independent projects. And the reason, I think, is because they, um, a lot of the other projects were contingent on like volunteer um, labor and things like that. And they were purely like um, just, um, almost like hobby projects or whatever. But Geeky actually um, was accommodating of commercial activity within their network. They said, you can make money off of Geeky, but Geeky itself, the, like, the backbone, if you will, it's not really a backbone, but like the, the backbone of Geeky will be um, an open commons infrastructure that nobody owns, but we'll accommodate commercial activity within it. And so this was, this was um, so fascinating to me because this spreadsheet, he was taking me through their whole governance policy and how it works. Basically, if you're a commercial, like if you're an ISP within Geefy, you can provide internet to people, like to grandmas on the farm that don't know how to set up their own node, they can't set up an antenna, or when lightning strikes, which is very common, they don't know how to re repair their antenna. So you could be a commercial ISP, to, you know, you're on call to repair antennas and stuff, and you can get paid and you can charge whatever you want. But the Geefy organization comes together and decides, for the purposes of internal calculations, how much the ISP's labor gets quantified at. And then there's, they did this big calculation where all the bandwidth that your customers use is automatically calculated by the routers and sent back to the, um, back to the, this, um, back to the people that manage Geeky. So the bandwidth usage is, is automatically calculated. Then the ISPs are um, asked to self-report any value that they put into the system in terms of labor or hardware. So if you buy a screwdriver, you report it. If you spend eight hours fixing an antenna after a lightning strikes it, you, you, you report that too. And all the, all the um, value that they've added zeroes out with all the value that is being taken out in bandwidth by their customers. And so the most exciting part about Geeky to me was this column right here, which shows which ISPs then owe some money back into Geeky. So if you've made more than you've if you've taken out more than, than you've put in, then you essentially have to pay money back into the commons to, um, but, if, but if you put in more than you're taking out, then you get a credit that, will, that you can carry forward. Um, so I just, it's just such a fascinating like sort of 
open common system that still is accommodating of like a lot of other types of economic activity. And I think that's partly why it kind of ended up subsuming a lot of the other, what they now call mesh islands. So like in Barcelona, there's like small mesh islands in small parts of the city that are connected through the kind of backbone of um, larger Gifi infrastructure that's still all managed by, by this system. Um, yeah, so that's, that's over time. I was gonna talk about one more example. Should I go through this really quick or? Okay, so the other example that I wanted to look at was um, here in um, Sedentapodo, which I, I'm sure I'm not pronouncing right, and I, like, like several times I had this conversation. Yeah, I'm trying to find um, Serantopro. I'm trying to find Ser Ser Serantoporo, and they're like, ah, Sedentapodo. But I, that happened over and over, I'm still not pronouncing it right. Anyway, Sedentapodo, I guess, is here. Has anybody heard of this project? Okay. So this is another small farming, uh, a rural, um, this is called La Sona. This whole area of Greece is called La Sona. It's a rural farming area. Um, they wanted to start their own um, community network as well. Just to give you some reference, this is Larissa, which is like the nearest big town. This is Thessaloniki and this is Athens here. Um, so yeah, I, I, I came to visit these people and this, this is the important, um, one, one of the important parts of the story because there's a, a polytechnic university here which agreed to donate bandwidth to them. They said, you know, we have fiber coming in from the internet exchange, which is here, which is the most of the, um, where almost all of Greece's traffic is routed through. We'll share with you some of our bandwidth, but you have to come and get it. And it's about, um, I don't know, 100 kilometers away over a mountain. So what they did was set up this amazing wireless link. So I'm now sitting here in Sedentapodo, looking this way towards Larissa. Um, this is Mount Olympus. And this little crook in the mountain here, this is called um, uh, Maluna. And Larissa is over this ridge at about another 40 kilometers. So from here on the hillside to here, it's about 40 kilometers. And what they did, since they couldn't get a direct line of sight to the university in Larissa, they set up a two-part wireless link with a point-to-point -point antennas here behind me where I'm sitting that goes to the top of this ridge and then another one that goes from that ridge to the university. It's amazing. And so I decided I had to drive this route and sort of reroute the route through my route, routing, kind of like, you know, I was playing one of the games that Ingrid was talking about. Like I was trying to reroute, well, anyway, you get the idea. So this is, I, I drove to this point here. Um, this is now at that point looking back. Sedentapodo is somewhere here. Um, and it was just fascinating to spend time at the top of this mountain. And like there was crickets and it was wind and it was beautiful. And I was just thinking about all the different labor that had gone into setting up these antennas. Um, they had leased, similar to Gifi, they had leased part of the antenna from the municipality, from the regional municipality who had put up, who had gotten a large grant after the crisis. There was a push towards internet connectivity in Greece. They gave out money to municipalities. This particular municipality received a lot of money put up some antennas here and never actually really connected anybody. Um, and so then this organization, this group of people in this town, actually a lot of them live in Athens, but they were born in the town and they went away for university and now they return back for the summers, but they wanted to connect this village, leased this antenna space for their antennas from the municipality. So on top of this hill, this is one of the um, cages. There's three separate cages for all the cell phone providers for the commercial radio and for commercial TV. Um, this is the Sedentapodo network that's pointing back to Sedentapodo. This is the one that's pointing to Larissa. This is a redundant one that's pointing to another member of the community that lives in Larissa. And this is another redundant one that points somewhere to another neighboring village. Um, this is another one of the cages here that has antennas for, um, it's out of the frame, for um, the commercial cell phone provider. Um, and I don't know if you can tell, but they have this, this adorable little terracotta roof here, which you can see um, a pile of discards here from when they were setting up these things. Like, I guess the guy that was making the tile just like tossed these aside. And so I brought this little piece of tile to share with you all. It says Larissa on it. So if you want to touch this, you can feel that you have been at this critical, which I pass it around. Just be very careful. This is the only thing I've done. If you want to feel like the, the aura of the space is now brought into this room. Um, and so this is then the antenna pointing the other direction. This is the view towards Larissa. And then this is now in Larissa. 
here at the university library. Here's the two antennas. And then this is the view from those antennas back towards Maluna, to the mountain here. So just to kind of like complete that link. Um, yeah, I guess the, the, the kind of ending on somewhat of a sad note, I guess, th this particular, the sudden top of network hasn't been able to do something similar to Geeky in the sense of like rolling out fiber and expanding the infrastructure. They're still dependent on this wireless link. Um, and I think it's because talking to people about why they haven't tried to replicate that, it's like they haven't, I, I don't know, they haven't, they, they feel that they have a different culture or something. They haven't been able to replicate this kind of trust in this communal activity as much to facilitate this like um, shared commons. They were talking a lot about the different problems that they've experienced in terms of like why they couldn't get, they, at one point it was free based on volunteer labor. They decided they want to start charging. People were unwilling to, to, to pay the fee and they would prefer to pay the commercial DSL even though it was slower. So there's all kinds of interesting social dynamics that I'm still trying to figure out in terms of why this particular example wasn't able to roll out fiber in the way that the, the Spanish example was. So anyway, yeah, that's it. Uh, do you have any like notes or like compiled documents about like your analysis of the two networks? And is that like public? Um, I have a ton of notes and I haven't published it yet. But I, I'm working on processing all that now and I have a lot more photos too. So I need to, uh, I'm still working through Getting it together. piles and piles of, I, had, I made a lot of audio interviews with different people and um, yeah. Um, and is the spreadsheet public? The no, the one? spreadsheet, I was hesitant to show that, like it was very blurry, so I think mm -hmm. it's okay to share, but I was a little, yeah. I, I mean, like not interested in like the numbers or anything, but like how, how they go about yeah. deciding like, how, like where the payments come from. Yeah, yeah, so they have a lot of public documents online of, that where they talk about how they govern their system. There, mm -hmm. There's certain details that like, I, I don't know exactly what specifically they are willing to share in terms of like how their spreadsheets are like laid out and stuff like that, but. It's like, like what's on their website would be. Yeah, like, yeah, they have like a quite expansive web presence <laughs> that talks about their, their rule. They have like a very large um, document that explains all their governance rules, like in, in, in quite like detailed cool. explanations about like, and they have this whole vocabulary of different roles that they've constructed. So it's, it's like, as much as it is like this open peer community network thing, they have like very specific roles. So there's volunteers, there's um, consultants, consultants are their term for commercial ISP providers. There's um, the, I don't know, there's the, govern, the governing um, members, things like that, and then there's just users. So there's all these different classes, and if you go to their governance document, which you can find on their website, they explain quite detailed how everything is yeah. It's cool. just, uh, I think it's ep.net. Hey, uh, really interesting that you went to the Battle Mesh thing. Uh, you know, I think a lot of us have followed it for years, but the website is a little light on documentation so I think whatever you can tell us is great and it was actually something very confusing reading the website but I think you touched on it and I'm surprised to see is that is, is it true that they only had one set of wireless mesh routers and they just reuse them for every protocol yeah so, so they kind of like wipe it every time or when yeah, they go yeah. from protocol to protocol or how does yeah, that yeah. work they, there was like like there was a lot of like nightly flashing yeah reflashing of um, I think it's just these um, those like ubiquity router. I could be wrong on. Look kind of like TP-Link. Yeah. Link. Oh, TP-Link. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. I'm I'm a little bit fuzzy on okay. all the details, but it's all in the report. If you, which I can send a link. They like, yeah, sure. But yeah. I, I I just I never saw that. I never got that detail from them before. So that that was actually a really fascinating thing to discover from your pictures is that they only use one set. I thought like everyone brought their own routers. And that I mean, was just a lot of people brought a lot of oh, routers. Did they? There okay. was, I mean, there was a lot. Of, there was, there was an image I didn't show, but at one point I like was on my phone to like join, and there was like scrolling through Wi-Fi networks. Yeah. You know, there was a lot of and and every like the, like the Libermesh guys, they had they had one of they had they had a couple of their routers there, so that was like that was two other mm -hmm. SSIDs. Yeah. There was like people from um, Fryfunk brought a bunch. People from the mm -hmm. Funk Foyer in Vienna brought a bunch. So there was yeah. like just tons of interesting but I think that they only had enough to actually you know like working um, like identical you know similarly spec hardware to set up one test bed mm -hmm. and then they were they were flashing it through different protocols and, and then, yeah. I see so so to go through the so be part of the test bed you had to use the routers in the test bed 
Yeah, or, yeah. Okay. There was like something like I don't know, um, whatever. There's like yeah. 15 nodes or something like that. Okay. So did did there did you see if they took any care to say during the test bed moment when you're actually doing the test, everyone else must turn off their routers, or is it kind of like whatever happens happens? You mean just for like the radio traffic? Yeah, yeah. Like a lot of places that'll do this kind of test, they, you know, during the open session, you could just do whatever you want, and then they're like, okay, it's time, everybody, and you turn off, and yeah. then you like, you know, have a nice quiet environment. Yeah, or is it no. no? They just I mean the the the, 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 the the nodes that were part of the test bed weren't for general use. Sure. But yeah. there, yeah, but there was still other like, eight hundred two eleven whatever activity like flowing through the air okay. constantly. Yeah. But actually, that was one of the things that that was in the report. So if you find if you go to the report, um, they had like, and this is one of the ongoing debates too. There was a lot of like frustration um, over the first couple of days about about how the test bed had functioned in the previous years. And people felt like in previous years they hadn't quite gotten to the point of having the test bed set up early enough to run all the tests. So that was like, a, like people were like very determined this time to like actually have the test bed set up very early and to actually be able to run the test. So that mm -hmm. I think that was one thing that was a little bit different this time from the previous times, where like in the past they had done some some tests, but it was like a little bit less organized. Yeah. Here they actually were able to to test several different protocols. Um, but they said for future years, that was exactly one of the things that they suggested. Like, we should have some of this happening overnight. Yeah. Well, everybody's like, you know, well, there probably, probably would be some less traffic. Yeah. yeah. Fascinating. It's just hard to tell. And it's good that somebody went so we can, like, it's more than honestly, just, just the website. Like the, the bigger part of it was really like the conference aspect. It was everybody yeah. coming together. They were sharing their work. They were giving really fascinating talks about, like, technical work, um, about, like, um, deploying examples of deploying. So it was really just like more of this like community coming, like this international community coming together. Mm -hmm. So like there was a strong attachment to actually running the test, but I feel like there wasn't much talk about the results of the test. It was more about just like talking about all the work that people have been doing. Yeah, interesting. Um, it, just one last question because I think we're way out of time um, about about Gleefy when. Um, when that, I, I don't know, I forgot the guy's name, I'm sorry. Uh, but Ramon Roca. Ramon, yeah. When he showed you this manhole where they first ran the connection, how did he kind of present it? Was it that just in Spain it's okay to just go pull fiber if you feel like it? Because in most countries and cities you can't just go do that. So what, what did, did they actually do that or was it kind of like they used that as like, hey, you better get us, you better get yeah, us access? So, I mean, it was, it was, I think they were pretty confident that it was like dark fiber, like it was not yeah. being used. It, it had been laid, it had been run when they built this road, but it wasn't being used because like they knew that nobody was using it. Like there was no commercial providers that were using it. Mm -hmm. So it was kind of like this thing where it was their way of proving that it was there and that they could, that they, that they could use it. And I think that was like, they used it as a leverage point I see. to then be able to establish a more legitimate use. I see. So but I will say that I think there's a super strong culture in Catalonia of just like, people coming together as communities and taking control of um, the means of production, whether mm -hmm. it's infrastructure, factories, or whatever. So like there, there was like a very strong sense among the people I talked to, it's like, yeah, we will have our own internet infrastructure. We will take over um, the, the, um, the main nodes of like whatever. Like as, so I think there's like a lot less trepidation about like, there's a stronger sense that like, the people have. So for example, there were some telephone poles that, that they were that they were running fiber along. And I was like, how did you get the rights to use these telephone poles from Telefonica to run fiber alongside the copper, you know? And they're just and he's like, well, the they they have a like an easement, you know, like the the commercial provider has been given like an easement to be able to use private property. These are people's farms to have these posts. And they're like, so we just told them like you either let us use the poles or we won't let you put the poles on our property or we'll build another pole right next to it and just be a huge pain in the ass for everybody you know so it's just like a lot more of this kind of just using yeah. leverage of the community it's a kind of pressure and yeah very interesting cool thanks <laughs>